Now we will explore how the American branch of the Illuminati aided and abetted Adolf Hitler, and how the Bushes were the first family when it came to treason. I've been an investigative reporter and a journalist for 35 years. I've worked in every major media market in the United States, and I've written for more than 100 newspapers and magazines nationally and internationally. So last September 17th, I became the first journalist in U.S. history to go to the U.S. National Archives and the Library of Congress and pour over the thousands of pages of documents in both places to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt or any refutation of the facts that Prescott Bush, the grandfather of George W. Bush, and George Herbert Walker, his maternal great-grandfather for whom his daddy is named, were Nazi traitors to the country who should have been tried for treason. Two weeks ago in uh, early August, uh, a major world newspaper, The Guardian of London, finally got on the story internationally and they flew a renowned reporter of theirs named Duncan Campbell over to Washington to take me back to the archives and Library of Congress so that they could verify that these explosive documents were real and I didn't have forged copies. Prescott Bush was the grandfather of George W. Bush and the father of George Herbert Walker Bush and George Herbert Walker Bush is named for his father-in-law George Herbert Walker. Prescott Bush graduated from Yale in 1917 and was in Skull and Bones with E. Roland Harriman who was the younger brother of W. Averill Harriman. The Bush family really had nothing going. They were essentially social climbers and opportunistic people. At the time that Prescott Bush met Dorothy Walker he was a tire salesman. And George Herbert Walker, as all fathers do when their daughter's going to marry someone, uh, said in his heart, you know, it, it's, not a, it's not an appropriate thing socially that my daughter marry a tire salesman. So he brought Prescott Bush first into Brown Brothers Harriman and then Union Banking Corporation. Uh, in actuality, it was anything but a bank. It was essentially a Nazi money laundering operation that had a lot of tentacles into a lot of different other businesses. They owned a, a shipping line called Hamburg American Line, for example, which was the first Nazi front business seized, although the line was no longer operational in 1942. In the early 1930s, it transported Nazi spies into the U.S., and then their promotional ads offered cash rewards to any American citizens who would go back on Hamburg American lines and proselytize for Hitler. Eight months after the U.S. had entered the war, the New York uh, Herald Tribune ran a front page article, Hitler's Angel has three million in U.S. Bank. And it caused a major scandal and just rocked the world of politics. Brown Brothers Harriman, which George Herbert Walker and Prescott Bush were affiliated with and partners in, uh, worked with I.G. Farben, which operated Auschwitz. Prescott Bush he did a number of things that were not only anti-American but were pro-Hitler and he did all that he could to proselytize for Hitler and the rise of his Third Reich because the largest client, Fritz Thiessen, of his patron, W. Averill Harriman, dictated what kind of behavior he would practice to enhance his own career. So he was put on the board of directors of Union Banking Corporation and he was also a shareholder in Union Banking Corporation along with E. Roland Harriman. But what's interesting about what the documents show is that they clearly state that all of the shareholders were phantom shareholders for Fitz Thiessen and did his bidding directly. So the point I'm making is it's not as if they bought these shares of stock as a passive investment to hopefully profit from the war. They were directly doing the bidding of the individual who built the Nazi war machine. Uh, some very shocking documents that I saw at the Library of Congress uh, two weeks ago on August 10th, uh, had on August 9th, excuse me, had to do with the hearings of the McCormick Dickstein Committee of November 1934. Show that Prescott Bush and the uh, DuPont family, the Remington family, and J.P. Morgan tried to overthrow the U.S. government, assassinate FDR, and put a Hitler-style fascist state in place. I have in my possession 
testimony from the McCormick Dickstein Committee in November of 1934 by one of the fascist plotters that they were going to follow Hitler's model exactly and impose martial law on the United States, round up unemployed people that were worthless to the economy and troublemakers and Jews and put them into internment camps. And their plan was, if necessary, to exterminate the people that could not be part of the effort. The only reason the coup attempt in 1934 didn't succeed is that they led, they hired the wrong general to lead it, General Smedley Butler, the great Marine hero, two-time Congressional Medal of Honor winner, who worked with the plotters just long enough to be able to identify who they were and then blew the whistle on them to Congress. Incredibly, after being warned by the FBI and the Justice Department and the Treasury Department to cease and desist in their Nazi dealings, they had continued them until 1951. There had been 28 additional seizures of Nazi assets and Nazi business fronts between late 1942 and 1951, and that they had moved Nazi assets into Switzerland, Brazil, Argentina, and Panama, and they had continued to do business with their primary Nazi patron, who was Fritz Thiessen, who backed Hitler beginning in 1921, and who was the wealthiest man in Germany, and a steel and coal baron, who with his partner, Friedrich Flick, essentially built the Nazi war machine along with I.G. Farben. In 1951, when uh, Fritz Thiessen died in Argentina, Union Banking Corporation was liquidated by the U.S. government, and Prescott Bush received $1.5 million for his holdings in his Nazi business, and that was the beginning of the Bush family fortune for all intents and purposes. George Bush doesn't take his philosophical foundation from the Bible or the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. George Bush takes his inspiration from what he learned in Skull and Bones and from the Thule Society that Hitler and Goebbels and Goring cut their teeth in, Bohemian Grove, these evil organizations that perpetrate the ugly things that these criminals are doing to this country for which they must be held accountable. Now you look at the Republican National Convention this week and you bring in Arnold Schwarzenegger to speak last night. Schwarzenegger is the son of a Nazi. He has praised Nazis. He has praised Hitler. He talked last night in terms like we will not falter, we will not waver, we will win this war on terror. He's a leader who doesn't flinch, who doesn't waver, and does not back down. Well, that's exactly the speeches that Hitler made after the Reichstag fire. Terrorism and the homeland being under attack are precisely the issues that Hitler used to subvert everything within the German system of government. This is a criminal regime. They not only emulate Hitler, but its genesis comes from Hitler. And I defy anyone, a historian, journalist, author, anyone, to come forward and disprove my premise that you cannot differentiate Hitler's invasion of Poland in 1939 and the Reichstag fire and his attempt to dominate the world from George W. Bush's unprovoked invasion of Iraq and subversion of the Constitution through the Patriot Act after 9-1-1, which I submit is his Reichstag fire. Karl Rove and his minions are every bit the masters of propaganda that Joseph Goebbels was. They literally took lessons from Goebbels and Goring about how to create such brilliant propaganda that unreality can become reality and reality can be subverted to fantasy political subterfuge right before your eyes. So there's just an endless broken record that is leading up to the present era that the Bush family has had a single goal for a hundred years, which is to become the most powerful family on the planet and to rule the world. And they are on the verge of doing that under George W. Bush. It's critical that every citizen of this country rise up and do something because the day of reckoning is at hand and uh, these people are Nazis, they are practicing Nazi philosophy, they are mimicking Nazi tactics and time is running out. Why haven't the networks made a TV movie of the week 
about how the Bush family made their family fortune. The movie could be called The Awful Truth, starring George W.'s great-grandfather Samuel P. Bush, whose Buckeye Steel Castings Company supplies parts for Edward Harriman's railroads, who in turn provides rail shipments for John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil, who in turn gets monopoly financing from the Rothschilds. The movie could be made into a TV series starring Samuel's son, Prescott Bush, as the managing director of a Nazi steel manufacturing plant in Poland called Silesian Consolidated Steel. In episode one, Prescott Bush forwards American financing to his German partner, Fritz Tyson through the Union Banking Corporation in New York. Fritz Tyson arranges a contract with Nazi Germany's IG Farben Company for free Jewish slave labor in Bush's steel manufacturing plant at the Auschwitz concentration camp. Episode 2 shows Skull and Bonesman Prescott Bush and Avril Harriman getting caught under Trading with the Enemy Act as the U.S. government moves in and seizes all of their shares in Union Banking Corporation. In episode three, Prescott's son, the first George Bush, is director of the CIA. George puts drug king Manuel Noriega on the CIA payroll, allowing thousands of tons of cocaine to hit the streets of America via the Panama Canal. In episode four, George's son, the second George Bush, becomes partners with Osama bin Laden's older brother, Salem bin Laden, in a Texas oil company called Arbusto Energy. Episode 5 introduces George W. Shady younger brother, Neil Bush, ripping off the elderly in the Silverado savings and loan scandal that cost U.S. taxpayers $1.3 billion. In episode 6, the Florida election is fixed by George W.'s older brother, Jeb Bush, who puts brother George into the top job at the White House. Which brings us back to Auschwitz and the concluding episode with George W. Bush visiting the slave labor camp where his grandfather helped build the Bush family fortune on free Jewish slave labor. Sites are a sobering reminder that of the power of evil and the need for people to resist evil.